Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Crouch. This is Policy Talks, and it's brought to you each month by Williamson, Inc., our uh, Williamson County Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we uh, are starting off our 2021 uh, series with our Williamson County Legislative Delegation again this morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome our audience. Uh, you may be on uh, cable channel three. Or you may be listening to us on WAKM AM 950, or you may be live streaming us on YouTube, but uh, we welcome everyone this morning and uh, look forward to a lively discussion about uh, things going on on Capitol Hill in Nashville. This morning, we've got with us uh, Majority Leader, Senate Majority Leader Jack Johnson, who represents our 23rd district here in Williamson County. We've got uh, Sam Whitson, our representative representing the uh, 63rd House District. And we're expecting uh, Glenn Kasna from the uh, 60, excuse me, he's he's in the 63rd District. Sam, you're in the 65th, my apologies. And uh, Brandon Whitson, or Brandon Ogles, a little rusty this morning, got to get uh, my 2021 uh, mind uh, going here. There's Glenn. Glenn joining us now. Just uh, to, to get started this morning, gentlemen, uh, everyone's concerned about the uh, coronavirus and the vaccine rollout. Uh, can one of you all give us a, an update on who is now getting the shots, uh, what uh, what the status is, and, and what where we're uh, looking to get people vaccinated? Sam, have you got that uh, information? Well, I, I, you know, I don't have it for the statewide. I know um, the last I heard, uh, they have the categories. Um, Pam watches that pretty close because we we're, we're both over 65. Uh, I think she's in category uh, 1B. Uh, I think they're doing 70 and above or 75 and above. Uh, some folks, I understand, are going to different counties to get it. Um, they're, they're, the priorities have shift sometimes as they find out more people in th different categories need it. Um, I was fortunate. I, I go to the VA um, and they dropped theirs to 65 and above. And I had my first shot last week, last Friday, and uh, no side effects. Uh, and I'll have the other one in three weeks. And um, uh, um, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a big logistical challenge. And um and I think they're trying the best they can. I would uh, love to see the teachers get moved up there and get uh, get them so we get the kids back in the classroom as soon as possible. Uh, this Friday, I'll be, uh, or next Friday, I, I wish I had that information, but I'll be on a three hour uh, Zoom meeting with the uh, Tennessee Life Science, the St. Jude Hospital, talking about the COVID uh, immunization program. And uh, I, I signed up to do that uh, myself and Dr. Uh, Senator Briggs uh, will be on that. Uh, and I can give you an update next Friday, more information. Sure. Jack, uh, do you have any additional information to that? No, I think I think Sam covered it quite well. The, the only thing I would add is that certainly call the Department of Health, um, the Williams County Health Department, and it, it is fluid and it's frustrating. It's confusing because the more vaccines we get, the more people can get them and the, the categories of eligibility are changing. And so, uh, and there's good information online as well, but the, the Department of Health, Williams County Department of Health should be the primary point of reference for that information. Right. Glenn, are you, Glenn, you're muted, but uh, we'd love to hear anything you've got to add to that. There we go. How about that? That's better. <laughs> uh, I do know that we're that on a percent basis, we're one of the top states in the union that have vaccinated the senior citizens, those at 74 and over. Uh, well, I think we stand right at 10 percent, which uh, I mean, Dave, if you put this in context, th this is uh, amazing. What we've done is bring a vaccine to the market in less than a year. And right. now we're distributing. I mean, that just has never happened before. So. I know it's frustrating because everybody wants to get immunized today, but right. there's things that, that I mean, the, the functions of life, it, it just makes that, makes what we've done remarkable and we should rejoice in that. Just uh, glad that uh, we're making progress on that front and uh, yes. we will uh, look forward to 
getting everyone vaccinated so that we can somewhat return to normal if we ever feel comfortable doing that again. Yeah, I'm sure this time, uh, either in a few months or this time next year, for sure, we'll be back over at Columbia State doing this. Right, exactly. That's uh, I'm looking forward to that. Just uh, to give you a kind of heads up on my thoughts on uh, where we're going this morning. First of all, I'd like to talk about the special session in detail for a few minutes, uh, and then we'll come back and talk about uh, the upcoming regular session and your committee assignments and uh, bills that you've uh, uh, filed. And, uh, and then if we have time, we'll come back and talk about transportation projects going on in, in Williamson County. But uh, first of all, uh, what, we had an unusual uh, rollout uh, this year with the governor calling a special session first. And uh, Jack, since you're involved heavily with the governor on uh, the bills and uh, how to uh, get them presented, could you give us an update on um, particularly the Medicaid block grant, what, uh, what the background was there and, and why the uh, urgency to uh, have a early special session? Sure, uh, and it, it, you, you said it very well, Dave. It's, it's been a very unusual, my most unusual start of session uh, in the time that I've been uh, in the Senate. So we obviously had elections in November, so we are starting a new General Assembly, just to remind your audience, uh, you're getting kind of into the nitty gritty weeds of our process. So every General Assembly is two legislative sessions, two years, and so we did convene a new General Assembly um, on January 12th. Um, we have new senators that got elected, have new house members that got elected. So they all get sworn in. We elect our speakers. That is usually a three day process. We come in, constitution calls us to come in on the second Tuesday of January at high noon uh, every year. And so being the first session of a new general assembly, we come in, we do procedural things. We adopt rules of order. Uh, again, elect our speakers. We get our committee assignments and all that's referred to as an organizational session. That usually takes place over a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then we normally take a break, usually a couple of weeks um, in order for new members to get their office assignments, to hire staff. Uh, you have new committee chairmen that have been appointed and they might need to hire staff or move into a committee suite. So we generally take a two week break and then come back and convene. Well, this year, because of the, the block grant uh, situation we had that I'll explain, and, and I know the House guys will want to chime in on, on it as well, <clears throat> we actually did our organizational process in two days. We knocked that out Tuesday, Wednesday, so that we could come out of organizational session into regular session in order to take up the resolution on the block grant. And then to further complicate things, Governor Lee did call us into a special session which we were to begin the, the following Tuesday. So <clears throat> the block grant legislation was actually not part of our special session. We were in regular session for that and then went into special session for education. So very quickly on the block grant, this is, this is uh, groundbreaking. I I'm so excited. Tennessee is the tip of the spear in something that's not been done in any other state. We are very effective and efficient with our TenCare program, which is our Medicaid waiver program. And we, uh, we are allocated a certain amount of money by the federal government that we can spend, and it's a matching program. It's either a two to one or a three to one match, federal <laughs> money to state money. And we have consistently come in under budget, uh, providing good quality care to all the people that we're required to provide care to. Uh, and we, consistently give money back to the federal government because we, um, we don't spend everything that we're allocated. And so what, what we, uh, two years ago, we passed legislation asking our TenCare folks to go to the federal government and say, look, we're running a great program here. Uh, we're coming in under budget. We should get to share in some of those savings and get to, to keep some of that money that we otherwise give back to the federal government in order to offer more and better care to more people. And so we, we filed that waiver request uh, about 18 months ago. We passed legislation authorizing TenCare to do it about two years ago. And so they have been in intense negotiations with CMS at the federal level. 
And I believe it was in November uh, or maybe around the 1st of December, uh, they approved our waiver request and said, you're right. Um, CMS said you should get to share in these savings and deploy that money back into more and better health care. And so uh, we can we can spend the whole hour talking about it. But in essence, it's very strict. We have to maintain our quality standards, our metrics. And this program is very, very heavily regulated and evaluated. But we're effectively going to get to to deploy uh, a significant amount of, of money, potentially in the hundreds of millions of dollars every year back into more and better health care for, for Tennesseans because we run we want run a great program. So we had to take up a resolution that authorized uh, Governor Lee's administration to execute that waiver. Uh, we did that. We knocked that out in a couple of days. And then we came back and began our special session on education. And I'm, I'll wrap this up and let the other guys chime in. But but effectively, the, the we did about three things. Uh, maybe four in the special session. Number one, we're going to implement a, an intensive learning loss mitigation program for our kids that, that have been in and out of school. Some kids have not been in school all year uh, for, for close to a year. Uh, others have been in part time. We know that we've had a setback in terms of our, <clears throat> our educational attainment with these kids. So we're going to put them in a it's, it's permissive to the families. Uh, but if parents want to, they can get their kid into an intensive six-week program during the summer to get them caught up uh, from a learning standpoint. Uh, we're also going to hold our teachers, our students, and our districts harmless on the, on the statewide assessments. Normally, that's part of their evaluation, and it, it would be unfair to, uh, to, hold them, you know, to, to hold them accountable for those results. We're going to take the test and gather the data, but we're not going to use it against them. And then, um, and then finally, we're, we, um, we're gonna give our teachers a raise retroactively back to January 1. We were unable to do so last year because of the budget situation. And so we're gonna increase the salary component of the BEP formula by about $41 million. That's about a 2% increase. That does not mean teachers will get a 2% raise necessarily because the BEP formula doesn't cover all teachers that, that are employed. So uh, that, that's a quick snapshot. Sorry, I rambled there, but uh, it, we've done a lot in two weeks. I'll just say, and we haven't even started the regular session yet. And we've been very, very busy. Glenn, you're uh, you're on the education committee, uh, and the special session, uh, as Jack mentioned, was uh, primarily addressing educational issues that have uh, come up because of the COVID crisis. Uh, give us your thoughts on what was accomplished in that special session and uh, how how it addressed the problems that uh, you, you guys saw out there. Yeah. And, and first, Jack did a very good job, very succinctly. You, you know, not many people know this, but I actually got an education minor and actually taught uh, high school for a little bit. And I've always been a strong proponent of phonics based learning to read. And over the years, we the nation and the state has gotten away from a phonics based mastery of reading to a sight learning. And so, so what we've done in the past, children would learn to read by memorizing the word and they would, you know, memorize the words. And then, but phonics teaches not only the children how to master words and then they can figure out how to, to how to uh, sound out the words, but it teaches them a critical uh, learning process of, of, of analysis. And so going to a phonics based reading, uh, Dave, I think will we'll bring benefits for years and we're really positively affect uh, our, our learning process in Tennessee. You know, in the past, our <clears throat> Achilles heel has been third grade reading. And, and a lot of our children haven't mastered that skill. And, and they, they perform poorly on the reading part of the test. And so uh, I feel like this will change that paradigm and, and bring us back to where we need to be on reading. So I'm just excited and very positive about the phonics based uh, uh, implementation that we've done. Great. And Sam, you're on the uh, upcoming health committee, uh, the Medicaid block grant bill. Are you seeing that as a solution to issues that uh, have been raised before? Well, first of all, Jack was exactly right about the money we returned. <clears throat> I wish I had the graphic, excuse me, <clears throat> we were shown. It shows the money that we're allocated each year for our ten care program. And we provide the services as required by the federal government to these folks who need that. But the amount of money that we return is amazing. So if you can see that graph um, that shows the amount allocated, the amount we spend, the amount we give back, 
this uh, and, and I think block grant is really kind of a misnomer. This is what we call the share savings model that we're that we're working here to implement. It's uh, it, 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 it's very innovative. Uh, there was a lot of concern about people losing services and stuff. We made a commitment not to do that. And this is different from uh, Medicaid expansion. We're, we're, this is focused on those people that we are serving right now under the 10 care program. And we get the money back that we say we can expand services and do other services for these folks. So uh, uh, Jack and Glenn covered that really well. One, hey, uh, one Dave, can I add one more? Could I add one more thing on the <clears throat> on the on the uh, block grant? The thing that a lot of people don't realize, and the media did a poor job of covering, is the our extension was about to expire, and so we were going to have to renegotiate ten care, as we call it, uh, and the chances of us getting the same sweet deal was pretty slim. And so we had to re renegotiate and, and uh, the governor and the, and the leadership in the house and the Senate did an excellent job with that. Great. And I think uh, as I, some of the things I saw, it extends our agreement with the federal government for 10 years. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the normal agreement is, has been five. It's been five years, but <clears throat> with the, our previous waiver extensions have been for five-year increments. This will be for 10, which is significant. Right. Uh, one aspect of the education uh, legislation that caught my eye is that uh, we're going to start holding third graders back if they don't, uh, if they're not reading on grade level. Is that, that was my understanding. Is that correct? It, it there is. Um, it, it, it is, Dave, but, but understand roughly 30, uh, it's around 35% of our third graders read proficiently. We are failing these kids. It is an abomination. It is absolutely unacceptable uh, what, is, what is transpiring. And, and what we've been doing as the status quo is just advancing these kids on up. And you can look at any study, uh, like Glenn, I have a degree in education, um, and if you're not reading by the end of the third grade, your chances of success, not only in school, but in life are diminished considerably. And so we are failing these kids if we're sending them on to fourth grade and they can't read. Having said that, we're not just going to hold them back. We're going to, we're, we're implementing this new literacy program as Glenn touched on, which is significant. We're going to do everything we can to equip our schools and our teachers with the tools they need to get these kids up to speed so they can read. You, you, you learn to read K through three, and then after third grade, you read to learn. And if you can't read, then you can't learn. And so, <clears throat> yes, we're making a very serious commitment. If these kids are not reading proficiently by the end of third grade, we're gonna, they're gonna make available all kinds of programs throughout the summer to get them up to speed so that they can advance and go on to the fourth grade. But if they can't, then yes, we're going to hold them back and we're going to stop advancing these kids and we're doing them a, a tremendous favor in doing so. And, and Dave, in addition to that, uh, there is a there is an appeals process. A lot of this discretion is left to the local LEA. And so it's not a mat. It's just not a black and white thing. There many factors are considered uh, before you hold back a third grade child. So uh, it's it's again, I just think what the leadership did in the Senate and the House and the governor on this is could be a game changer, I really do, in our education system. And, and Dave, if I could add to, um, you know, those below, um, about 28% of the, all the students are approaching. So they, with our remedial programs, we feel that we can get them up to speed. It's really the 4 or 5% that's going to be the real challenge. Uh, but the remedial programs that we put in place over the next two years and beyond uh, will really help those kids that really need it. Sounds, sounds good. Uh, in case anyone on the radio uh, joined us late, we're talking this morning to the Williamson County Legislative Delegation, our Senator Jack Johnson, Representative Sam Whitson, and Representative Glenn Casta. Uh, just so everyone knows who's, who's speaking and uh, uh, giving us such a, a good analysis of what's going on in, uh, in, in Nashville. So the regular session, as I understand, uh, will begin on February 8th, a little over a week from now. Um, you all have new committee assignments this year. Jack, I believe you are uh, 
member of the Calendar Committee, Commerce and Labor Committee, Ethics Committee, and the Finance, Ways, and Means Committee. Now, the Finance, Ways, and Means, you, uh, you pretty much watch everything that's being spent by the state government. Is that correct? That, that is true. And then, of course, uh, in my capacity as a majority leader, I'm also the sponsor, Senate sponsor of the state budget. And so working very closely with the administration and the members of the Finance Committee, on, uh, on, that, on that budget process. It's the biggest and most important thing we do is, is allocate your tax dollars and decide how, how to appropriately spend them. Right. The, uh, now, uh, Glenn, the uh, committees, like I said, you are uh, on a couple of different uh, education committees, it looks like. Yep. Uh, any particular agenda that you're seeing uh, coming forward this year? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of bills uh, filed on the House side, Dave, that has to do with masks in school, with mandatory school attendance. Uh, and and uh, so that's going to be a hot topic is how do we handle pandemics uh, in our schools as far as closing mandates, et cetera, from this point forward? And so there, we'll, we'll sp be spending a lot of time on that topic. Right. Okay. Sam, you've, uh, you've got a long list of committees that uh, – the uh, our uh, house speaker is uh, assigned to you transportation subcommittee transportation committee uh, I personally am glad to see you uh, involved in uh, deciding how our transportation dollars are going to be spent here in uh, middle Tennessee uh, on a couple of ethics committees subcommittees finance ways and means and the health committee uh, you going to be able to cover all those bases? Yes. Uh, well, I hope so. Um, again, I, I always want to thank Glenn, though, for getting me on transportation and making me a chairman, transportation sub. This year, um, the speaker um, streamlined that a little bit. We only have one transportation subcommittee now. So all transportation bills will come through my sub before it goes to the full committee, uh, chaired by Dan Howe, a good friend. And uh, so... Um, don't see a lot of transportation projects coming up on the uh, through the committee, but you never know. Uh, there be the standard stuff dealing with safety, and and we look forward to that. We have not had our briefing yet from Tdot. Uh, we'll be doing that shortly. Um, on finance, ways and means, full and sub. This week uh, we had our budget hearings for our agencies across the state. Uh, they lasted all day. Everything from uh, you know the historical uh, commission to uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, wildlife uh, game and wildlife folks. So it was a very interesting uh, conversation, long drawn out, but it, it, it was, uh, it was good. Uh, I was glad to see my good friend and uh, uh, Patsy Hazelwood out of Signal Mountain. She is now chairman of the finance ways and means committee. Uh, Patsy and I chair, uh, shared a desk on the house floor for the past two years and now she's moved on up to the center aisle and uh, I switched over to her desk on the floor. And um, so uh, looking forward to that to be a, a lot of work. The uh, health committee, uh, I'm on the full health committee. I'm sure we'll be dealing with some issues of that from the pandemic and COVID and such. And, um, and I'm on the select ethics full committee and that's chaired by our deputy speaker, Curtis Johnson, and but also, and I, I really didn't know much about this other committee. It's the Select Ethics Committee uh, subcommittee. There's only four people on that. It's chaired by the Speaker Pro Tem, Pat Marsh, and I'm on. And it's only four, two Republicans, two Democrats. My friend Karen Camper and Bill Beck are the other members, and we deal. That committee um, takes reports of discrimination or sexual harassment uh, by members and uh and that's we we deal with that based on the investigation that we're given and make recommendations so that's going to be interesting and also uh i've just been appointed to the intellectual and developmental disabilities uh statewide planning policy uh council and i look forward to that and uh, a couple other things tennessee history for kids and uh and a t t uh TDEC, um, Environmental and Conservation Committee on State Parks. I'm working on one of their boards. You're going to be very busy. And, and 15 uh, bills. <laughs> Jack, I want to come back to you. Uh, you, as Majority Leader, as you mentioned, are, are responsible for presenting all the governor's bills, uh, including the budget. Um, and normally, uh, we're, we're accustomed to seeing the 
the governor having a high priority item that uh, we uh, see him most interested in. A couple of years ago, it was the, the gas tax. What are the priorities this year of the governor and uh, of you personally? Well, I think with all of us, so much of what we were focused on last session, we, we had to sideline when the pandemic hit and we had to really just focus on critical items to get through this, this year. Uh, and so a lot of the governor's agenda from last year uh, got sidelined as did a lot of other legislation. And so we're gonna pick up kind of where we left off and revisit much of that. Uh, a lot of it, and we talked about it a good bit last year, <clears throat> is gonna center around criminal justice reform. This is something that the uh, something that the governor is very passionate about. He's been very active uh, uh, on on kind of a uh, volunteer basis and philanthropic basis uh, in in criminal justice uh, reentry programs and and things of that nature. And so there's a fairly extensive legislative package that will be that we filed introduced last year, but we didn't pass it. Uh, but we'll we're going to reintroduce a lot of those bills. Much of it centers around uh, reentry. Uh, we send people who do bad things to prison. They pay their debt to society, and then we kick them back out onto the street. We don't really equip them to effectively reenter society and become a productive citizen. And oftentimes, they end up reoffending and end up back in in the system. And so, we're going to implement some programs to better equip uh, folks that uh, that are coming out of the criminal justice system. And in terms of housing, finding a job, education, uh, having the tools that they need so they can come out and lead a productive life. And then also alternatives to incarceration. Um, again, we're rehashing some stuff we've talked about before, but it bears repeating. Uh, the good example that I use here in, in the 21st Judicial District, which is Williamson, Lewis, Hickman, and Perry counties, we have a very effective recovery court program, uh, drug court, DUI court, veterans court, and, and what these do is, is they basically take, say, let's use drug recovery court, the drug court as a good example. Someone that's perhaps had multiple offenses with drug possession, um, they, they are an addict, um, they're, they're abusing substances. Um, rather than just send them to, to prison for six months or a year, whatever the case might be, uh, we put them through an intensive rehabilitation program and the, the recidivism rate of that is much, much lower than traditional re, uh, uh, incarceration. So what you have is someone that's going through a drug court type program. They can work a job. So they're, they're paying taxes. Uh, they can be a parent to their kids. Um, and we're not spending $30,000 a year on a prison bed for them. So it's truly a win, win, win. And I always emphasize these are for nonviolent offenders. These are not you know, people that have committed assault or rape or murder or those types of things. Those people, we're going to lock them up. We're going to send them to prison. But for nonviolent offenders, these types of programs have been far more effective. And we have good programs here in our judicial district, but they're not consistent across the state. So we can take programs like we're using here in Williamson County and, and, and the rest of the 21st Judicial District, which in a year, Williams County will be its own judicial district, but that's a different conversation. But um, but we, we can replicate those types of programs across the state and expand them where they are working. And it just makes a, makes a lot of sense. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, it's something that the governor is very passionate about. And I'm looking forward to working with him on that. A lot of, a lot of moving parts there and uh, just a personal experience. I've uh, uh, mentioned uh, in the past, we uh, our family bought a farm down in Murray County a couple of years ago. And one of the, neighbors uh, is served his time in uh, uh, West Tennessee State Penitentiary and is trying now to get back into the real world and uh, he's having a difficult time uh, negotiating the rules that he's having to live by and still try to make a living now and uh, he's uh, worked for off and on for years with uh, one of our construction company friends here in Williamson County but uh, he's uh, He's struggling to, to make the connection back into the real world. So uh, I, I can see there are some issues there and uh, look forward to hearing progress on that. Glenn, you're, uh, um, again, like I mentioned, you're heavily involved on the education side of, of things. And uh, I 
total list of the bills that you filed so far. Mm -hmm. Give us a, a synopsis of the bills that you have filed this uh, this year and that you want to try to uh, advance as the session. There, there's a couple that are kind of big picture bills that I'm working with uh, the Senate sponsor and, and members on the committee that will go through. But uh, number one, uh, there are times because of pandemics that will come in the future, Dave, where we will need businesses to close down. But what I think we need to address is we cannot expect that small business owner to absorb the full economic loss of shutting down. And so I'm working on a bill that uh, that if uh, any level of government ask a small businessman to close down that they will be uh, that the businessman will be compensated for that time that he's asked to be closed by that government entity uh, and, and again we've we've devastated many small businessmen in our state and we've asked them to bear the brunt of this and it should be because it's a benefit to all the to all the health of all Tennesseans Tennesseans through the tax revenues are the ones that should um, bear the brunt not small individual businessmen. So that's something I'm working on. It's, it's a little tricky how to make it work, uh, but that's, I think that's important from this point forward, Dave. That would be uh, extremely expensive for a local or state government to uh, compensate all the businesses that have been uh, shut down this year, this past year. It, it would be. And that's and that's what I'm trying. I don't want to bankrupt our local governments or state government. But again, we are bankrupting small businessmen. So there has to be a, a happy median in there somewhere. The. Uh, you're also working on a bill on. Uh, what dates we can sell alcoholic beverages. <laughs> and so. Tell us about that. <laughs> that is a, a personal uh, I was responsible for bringing wine to the Christmas Eve family get together. And guess what? There's certain days of the year that we cannot buy wine. <laughs> so so as, as minor as that is, I think it's something that most Tennesseans would like the option of buying their, their wine or, or whatnot on any holiday, not just uh, <laughs> not <to> select you. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting uh, bill. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. I'll mention one more that I'm working on that I haven't filed yet, Dave, and I, and I do think it's important, is that under this current pandemic rules, we've given all authority to the Commissioner of Health and the health departments. And I feel strongly that this authority should be kind of uh, diffused to the Department of Health and the health department, as well as local officials. So I'm working on legislation that would give more authority and input to the elected individuals in the state when it comes to determining uh, testing, uh, the results of testing, uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic cases, just more information and more say so to the elected individuals, uh, not just to the bureaucracy, the Department of Health. Jack, has the Senate got any views on uh, any of these bills that uh, Glenn's working on? <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Uh, uh, I think the Senate will look favorably on, on on a lot of those ideas conceptually, and and you know this is this is the process. We've been through a very interesting and challenging year. Uh, you know, we have all received countless emails and phone calls, social media messages about our kids being in school, and and I think it's important that at some point during this program we do it. So I'm going to do it now. Is that 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 we're all very concerned about that. You know, we have 147 school districts in Tennessee, 145 of them are back in person uh, at, to some degree. It might be hybrid. It might be, you know, sometimes some schools are back, you know, in person uh, full time. Our kids need to be in school. And our two largest districts, Nashville and Memphis, refuse to, to go back to in-person learning. We talked about it during our, our, um, our special session and tried to figure out a way that we can compel those districts to offer an in-person choice for parents. Uh, it's so disruptive uh, for, for working families and to have small kids at home. Um, and, and we believe, I believe personally, and most everyone in the General Assembly believes that, that kids can go to school safely. It can be done for the teachers and the students. And we need our kids back in school. We weren't able to come up with a way during special session. It's very complicated with the BEP formula, with communication that's out there. But uh, I just want anyone who's listening right now to know that I want our kids back in school. They need to be back in school. 
they're much safer in school and have uh, uh, the science shows us that you have a greater likelihood of, of probably contracting the coronavirus by being cooped up in your house all day long with folks, you know, uh, going out and potentially get, getting exposed. Uh, so we need our kids back in school. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of frustration with Williams and County Schools and, and Franklin Special. Um, you know, the, we're working with them and I think they're doing the, the, the best that they can. Uh, but let's just all agree that we need to get our kids back in school safely as soon as we can. Sam, Glenn, any comments on that? Well said on the on the senator's part. I couldn't agree more. Just um, have great appreciation for people who stand up and run for school board. Okay, they, uh, <laughs> they, they got the tough. You ask any state legislator or up there, uh, what's the toughest elected position they ever had? They will, to the person they will tell you serving on the school board. And so we appreciate people. Um, standing up and doing that public service and those administrators is, is a tough job when you dealing with people's children and grandchildren. You're here. Um, Glenn, one other bill that I, I saw on your uh, bills filed, uh, kind of surprised you need a, a, a bill to uh, address this, but uh, it's to prohibit wildlife resource officers from uh, installing cameras, uh, monitoring devices on private property. Uh, yes, I'm surprised that's even legal. So I am too, Dave. I don't understand how it is legal, but at, as as we speak at this moment, uh, those listening devices are being installed on private property, and, and there are two cases where the where the private property owner attempted to take the the device down, and the they've been taken to court. Now I don't think the court have has opined yet. So it's always important that state law is clear. Uh, on what can and cannot be done. It gives direction to the courts. Uh, but more importantly, it's just the general concept uh, that, that, that the private private property ownership is one of our most basic rights. And if you put something on my private property, I don't want it. I should have the authority to take it down. So I'm, my intent is to make it clear in Tennessee code annotated that, that just that case, if it's private property and you don't get permission, you can't put a listening device up. Right. Sam, let's look at uh, the bills you filed just a minute. Uh, one, I noticed uh, to add a full-time public nurse position in every school. Right. i uh, been working on that one for the past year. Um, under the BEP, the ratio for school nurses is 1 to 3,000. And that's why we fund uh, for the school systems. Of course, many systems like our schools have nurses in them full-time. Uh, the, um, the recommended ratio is one to 750, uh, uh, one nurse to 750 students. If we did that, the cost to the, uh, would be around $42 million a year recurring costs. So we're looking at ways to do that. I've, I've met with uh, Butch Ely, the finance um, commissioner under the administration and, um, and um, Bill Dunn, the uh, special assistant to the Department of Education. We discussed this uh, ways to, um, to make this happen either eventually in the governor's budget or through legislation. It's, it's going to be a tough uh, uh, piece to fund. I understand that, but we just want to make sure we get the word out and, and see what we can do because school nurses can do things. A lot of people don't understand a school nurse with, with the children we have, they have to, you know, administer the medications for, you know, like insulin and uh, certain pills and stuff to children uh, that have these conditions. And, um, and that's something you just don't want to put a teacher or administrator in position if they get that wrong. So there are requirements we put on the school to do and uh, to take care of these kids. And also school nurses um, can also intervene and, and look for mental health issues. Things, um, they can do things mental health officials can can do, but a lot of mental health officials cannot do things nurses do. So we think nurses may be uh, part of the answer for school safety and uh, also uh, for the first line health for a lot of these children in distressed counties. Right. Love to, uh, I enjoy hearing the behind the scenes color on, on all the things you all have to deal with uh, as oh. you uh, represent us downtown. But uh, i looking back over my notes, uh, Come back to you a minute, Jack. And uh, one thing I was curious about is how the revenues are coming in versus the budget this year. What uh, are there any adjustments that are going to have to be made 
um, and uh, give us an update on, on those issues, if you will. Sure, be glad to. So just to remind everyone that the way our budget process works is we forecast revenues. We have a funding board that's made up of economists, the constitutional officers, and they basically look forward and try to make a projection in terms of economic growth in the state and how that will translate into tax revenue via sales taxes, franchise excise taxes, and so forth. We're always very conservative with those numbers traditionally, and that's why our state is in the great fiscal condition that it's in. Um, you, states get in trouble when they say, oh, we think our revenue is going to grow at 4%. And so they base a budget on that. Then it grows at 2%. And now they got a hole. They got to dig themselves out of. Uh, we don't do that. We were very conservative traditionally, even in good times. So if you go back a year ago, when our economy is booming, we've got the lowest unemployment rate we've ever had and revenues are doing well. We keep cutting taxes. The more we cut taxes, the more our revenue goes up. Uh, because the Laffer curve does work. You find that, you know, efficient frontier out there. Uh, and then the pandemic hit. And so that's when we stopped everything last session and said, first and foremost, we have to protect the fiscal integrity of the state. And so we, uh, we basically passed a budget that presumed zero growth. And, and so we didn't, we, we did a flatline budget from the previous year to the current fiscal year. And, uh, and, and then hope for the best, because we really had no idea. You think back to where we were, we had no idea what was going to happen with our economy and businesses being shut down and so forth. The good news is um, that we did have growth. And, and in fact, we had some fairly significant growth in, in the economy. My concern is this, however, um, there's been so much federal money injected into the economy through stimulus, unemployment, and so forth. And at some point, that has to stop. And I know that President Biden is proposing another $2 trillion, and, but at some point that has to stop. We're, we're approaching a $30 trillion national debt. Um, and when that does stop, that's when I think you get a real measure of where the economy truly is. And so, again, the good news is we are exceeding our revenue projections. That means we will have, we will book that as one-time non-recurring money. Uh, what we over collect in a given fiscal year over our projection, we take that and book it as non-recurring money. We can use that for things like deferred maintenance on, on buildings, for capital projects, uh, making lump sum contributions into our pension program and so forth. So we'll, we'll have that money, but then you have the recurring side. So we'll set a new baseline for the next fiscal year in, in, in terms of that projection. That's where we have to be very careful, I think. And we will be able to, and the governor has, has already indicated that he plans to, uh, in addition to the 2% retroactive uh, increase in the BEP formula for, for salaries, for education, he also wants to do that for state employees and then do a full 4% recurring, which would basically mean a 2% for the previous year and 2% for the coming fiscal year. So things like salaries for state employees, the salary component for the BEP formula, those are recurring expenses that we want to, we want to address. Uh, so uh, to, to kind of summarize, it's good news. Um, and Tennessee was in the best fiscal condition it's ever been in as we came into this pandemic. And that was, that's a good thing because it enabled us to weather it better than a lot of states. Our friends in California, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, they were bankrupt effectively before the pandemic. And now this has pushed them over the edge. And I, I don't know how they recover. There's talks about trying to bail them out from the federal government. We'll see what happens with that. But Tennessee was in great fiscal condition coming into this. We're, we're in great fiscal condition now. We just have to be very cautious as we move forward. Right. Now, I'm going to toss this one out to the all three of you. Uh, but understand... You know, of course, one of the local priorities for budget issues this year will be the next building at Columbia State Community College here in Franklin. And uh, I know, Sam, you're very interested in that. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, Dave, the uh, Tennessee Higher Education Committee uh, recommended capital outlay projects for this year includes the uh, new arts and technology building at Columbia State. Uh, it's in the top three. Um, that's their recommendation. Um, it, it would cost $28 million to complete. Um, we will support that, uh, our delegation, and uh, uh, we, we are optimistic that that will be funded this year. Good. 
Jack, any insights on that? No, Sam, Sam's right. Um, uh, and again, that's a great example of where we can use that one-time money. Uh, we have really tried hard in recent years to pay cash for large capital uh, projects rather than bond those projects over a 20 year period of time. And we're gonna continue to do that. And when the pandemic hit, we did agree to issue some bonds on to, in order to preserve our cash. Uh, it was a small amount. We are still the least indebted state in the nation per capita. And we wanna keep it that way. That's, that's, that's where we wanna be. We have very, very little debt in Tennessee and we wanna keep it that way. So because we're so conservative with our, our fiscal projections, we're able to book that one-time money when we close out a fiscal year, we can pay cash for those large, uh, large item projects. So, and again, it's, it's things like uh, higher education uh, facilities, off state office buildings, uh, those types of maintenance, pro deferred maintenance on those buildings and, uh, and, and state parks is, is another one. We we're, we're falling behind in terms of uh, maintenance on, on our state parks. Uh, our, our mutual friend and my predecessor uh, is now a deputy commissioner of environment, uh, former Senator Jim Bryson, and uh, he's doing a great job in that, in that role. I had lunch with him uh, not long ago, and we're going to try to set aside uh, some money. I want to say it's around 25 to $30 million, again, one-time money that we can use to continue to, to uh, rehabilitate and, and remodel our, our state parks because there's a tremendous amount of deferred maintenance. And by the way, in this pandemic, the usage uh, utilization of our state parks has skyrocketed, which is wonderful because we have a wonderful uh, state park system. People are using them, not only Tennesseans, people from other states are coming in and visiting our state parks. Uh, so we need to take care of them and we're gonna try to get caught up on some of that maintenance. Right. Uh, one other subject, uh, the bombing in Nashville uh, affected a lot of our communication systems around the state in a, an unexpected way. What, uh, what is the House, House of Representatives uh, view on anything that needs to be addressed there, gentlemen? Um, well, I, I can say for sure a missile did not do that damage, okay? I, I'm yeah. pretty confident. Our, our military <laughs> veteran speaking there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that that did show some uh, some issues, um, and there needs we need to look at the redundancy of the communication systems, especially emergency communications across the state, um, and not, not just for communications, but for those uh, sites that handle our money transfers across the state or vital information. Uh, we, uh, I think um, I'm not involved in it, but I'm sure there will be uh, legislators will be ho uh, holding hearings and looking at legislation on that today. Well, we, we want to be kind to AT&T because they're one of our uh, show sponsors here, but, uh, and, and they do a lot for the state. Uh, we all know, but uh, I know there was some concerns about that. The uh, transportation projects in Williams County are always an important subject and we got just about five minutes to cover all of them. So if uh, Sam, uh, what's our expected uh, completion date on Mac Hatcher as it, as it stands? Well, you know, the, uh, the original projection date was September uh, this year, but it's looked like they're moving along pretty, pretty fast. I was out there the other day looking at it. If, if you drive down Hillsborough Road and see that bridge, the, the Charles Sargent Bridge, the longest bridge in Williamson County, uh, it, uh, they're doing really uh, a great job on that. And uh, so we hopefully by early summer uh, that it will be completed. And there's, there's just another lot, uh, a lot of projects going on right now. Uh, if you go out uh, past Arno Road to Triune, they're moving a lot of dirt out there on 96 to widen that. Uh, there's a lot of planning going on on 31 uh, coming up from uh, all the way from uh, Spring Hill to uh, Mac Hatcher up by Target. But one of the most exciting things we have going on and the contract was left this month was the interchange over at Buckner Road and I-65. And I, I was gonna I, ask, is that is that in your district or Glenn's district? Uh, I think both. It's in, it starts in mine and ends in Glenn's. <laughs> I'll let both of you weigh in on that then. So anyway, but it will go from uh, Buckner Lane over to Lewisburg Pike on the other side, on the east side of I-65. And the good news is that's going to be a design-build contract that they awarded. So we anticipate that 
that project should be done by uh, May of 2023. And uh, and I just want to compliment again uh, the city leadership in Spring Hill, Rick Graham, Victor Lay. They they pumped in 25 million dollars to jumpstart that 54 million dollar project, and they worked really close with TDOT on that. And uh, and that's why it really really gets these things jump started. And like I said, we're doing a design build concept rather than traditional design bid build. Uh, it will expedite it. Uh, it worked very well up on the uh, 440 project in Nashville. And uh, we anticipate this project will do the same way. I don't think that will take so much traffic off of 31 coming out of Spring Hill at the Franklin at the 840. So I, I think that is a, a much needed project and I was glad to see that. Our project, uh, the, um, the other let, project. Let, let Gwen uh, weigh in just a minute. Uh, Gwen, that's going to have a uh, significant, tremendous effect uh, on uh, the traffic issues down in Bethesda and the southeast part of the county, won't it? It, it will, it, to, to, to the positive. And because, as like Sam said, it will take a lot of traffic off of 31. The city of Spring Hill is, at certain times of the day, is deadlocked. And this will help that traffic greatly. Um, and Dave, if I could kind of explain, Sam said that it's so very important. Road building, the I, the construction, the future planning of roads in any community is based, is, is based on the local government working with the regional planning organizations who in turn take these needs to TDOT. And then the, the delegation, be it us or whatever county, takes the baton at that point. And so it's not a it's not a top-down system in Tennessee where TDOT says we're going to build a road here and we're not going to build a road here. It's very cooperative. The cities band together. They make their needs known to their regional planning commission, who in turn makes that need known to TDOT, and then the plans go from there. So Sam, Sam articulated that well. I wanted to help the listeners understand how the process works in Tennessee. Uh, while we got you, Glenn, uh, Murfreesboro Road between here and uh, Murfreesboro, uh, what's the what's the progression there the time that people should expect that construction to be going on? We're hoping that it'll be completed spring of 22, sometime uh, before the summer of 22, at which uh, uh, they're moving quickly on that. They're moving dirt. That seems like an aggressive timeline to me when I drive by, drove through there the other day. But uh, they are moving, and it's uh, it's really needed as a as an artery between the two fast growing communities. Um, and one more I'll mention: it does. It's not predominantly in in Williamson County, but the uh, Nolensville Road, as we call it, from Nolensville to Nashville, that's also being expanded. Most of that's in South Davidson, uh, but it will help the Nolensville community get up north from, from their homes. Right. And Dave, there's a plan to rebuild the Morris Lane interchange there at I-65. So that's going to be a big project. And that project from Morris Lane up to Concord Road is moving right along. And uh, they had some issues with, uh, relocation of utilities, but uh, again, moving a lot of dirt and laying a lot of pavement. Right. Uh, Brandon Ogles was not able to join us this morning. He was having technical issues, I got a note uh, a few minutes ago. But uh, Jack, you can give us an update on Franklin Road and uh, what we're, I know there's a, of course we got the project in downtown Franklin and then also uh, through Brentwood as well to uh, improve that uh, corridor. Yeah, and, and if you've driven through there lately, I, I was through there the other day and, and a lot of, again, dirt being moved and asphalt being laid. And, and that's been a, a project that's been a long time coming and will tremendously help uh, the northern part of the county and th through Brentwood there. And I'm thinking, I can't give you an exact date, but I, I think the projection is for that project to wrap up this year. One thing that's, that's interesting, we saw this with the 440 project in Nashville. Uh, is if you could maybe call it a silver lining with the, with the pandemic, which I certainly wish hadn't happened, but with more people working from home, our traffic counts have been down fairly considerably. Those of us who have to drive to Nashville frequently can, can attest to that. I can get to the Capitol in about 25 minutes, even during rush hour when, you know, it used to take closer to an hour sometimes, but that's enabled uh, TDOT and, and the contractors to expedite some of these projects. That's one reason that uh, 440 was able to come in ahead of schedule and under budget. And that's also helping some of these other projects on existing uh, roadways. Obviously, my catcher, um, it, that, that, that's not an existing roadway, so it's not as, as 
doesn't make a difference as much there. But on some of these others, it's been a real benefit. And Dave, if I could add, for Fairview, uh, expanding uh, Highway 100 from Bowie Lake Road out to 840, the planning document is underway, environmental studies and impacts, and they're taking a look at that too. So we, we hope we get that jump started too. Good. I expect our transportation uh, committee to uh, uh, use whatever influence they have to uh, advance these uh, Williamson County projects, and uh, <laughs> we'll look forward to getting progress reports from you throughout the year, gentlemen. We'll wrap it up uh, there, gentlemen. Uh, it's been a, a, a good discussion. We appreciate uh, your taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, fill us in on all those uh, issues and uh, exciting things going on down on Capitol Hill. Uh, I want to thank several people that or have to work together to make this program happen. Uh, first of all, Creed Henderson and the crew at WCTV, Cable Channel 3, uh, make us look good every month. Uh, Tom Lawrence over at WAKM and the team there uh, make sure that we are heard around the county and um, our sponsors at Vanderbilt and AT&T in a financial way help, uh, help make it happen as well. And then obviously without the chamber staff, uh, none of this would have ever happened. And uh, Kel McDowell's leading the pack on this particular effort, uh, Matt Margin, Nancy Conway, Griffin, and Jenna, we all appreciate uh, all you do to make us uh, look good. Next show will be Friday, uh, February 25th. And uh, gentlemen, we look forward to having you back then and uh, getting an update uh, as things uh, progress downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Enjoy it. We'll see you.